Here is a knowledge lecture for the various titles of the Essene Zealot of the Pythagorean Order of Death, also called a Grand Master and Raised from the Cult of Sleep. The first title is Grand Master. The title of Grand Master has come to mean of a lodge. However, the meaning of this concept, that of what is a lodge, is often overlooked. The Native Americans held sweat lodges, and many meeting places for discussion of esoteric matters are blatantly public among city dwellers. As I have stated elsewhere, even a wooded clearing can be consecrated for divine ritual by any member and numbered coven. A minimum of five regular members is preferred, and there is significantly sacred numerology and geometry to support the theory that member numbers, as well as ranks and roles, should expand according to the sequence of prime numbers. A grand master of a lodge, then, is someone who understands how to operate a basic member number lodge or coterie, a circle of friends, as a means of sharing the experience, that is, co-guiding, along with these others, to achieve first the means for each self to accomplish its goals, and second, for the group to establish an active dynamic. These basic principles, the good of the self before the group, but the good of the group follows one's own good, are accepted as mathematical governing dynamics and comprise a fundamental premise in economics as well. Therefore, there can be more than one grand master among any prime numbered group of people. Ideally, every member would be able to consider themselves equally much the leader. However, not all ask what is a lodge, and so not all understand it by this simple definition. Therefore, in any group, there is always going to be one person prone to follow another, and who, likewise, by turning their back to them, becomes the leader of yet a third. These roles have been established by anthropologists studying animals that roam in packs or tribes. The alpha member of the group is usually equally as intelligent, though more competitive, than their predecessor. This role is determined by genes, that is, whoever is most fit for this position will prevail ultimately. A procession more like the inheritance of a titular office by promotion to replace the previous holder ex officio, rather than a linear inheritance from parent to child of such status, duties, responsibilities, etc., as are entailed in entitlement to position. Whoever is the most qualified in any situation encountered by a group of equal individuals will be permitted to lead them collectively at that time and until the end of the necessity of their specific expertise. This is similar to the behavior of a colony of ants during a flood. They gather around the queen in the center to form a natural raft. These ants all moving at the will of their queen, can then move in unison, floating in currents, and can thus travel around on the surface of the water, moving this way and that. This is also a model of the nervous system that connects countless numbers of singular neurons, nerve cells, to perform the commands of the ego, occupying each simultaneously that unifies them all. Likewise, this is also a model of the cosmos, 
whose intergalactic filaments resemble nerves. Just as the intergalactic filaments and genetic neurons, so too does every group of people obey the principle that whoever is ahead, or in the lead, so to speak, is only guiding the whole group ahead in that direction. However, even as we see galaxies colliding into and devouring one another due to their mutual gravity, and even as we find the nerves of a living system accumulate ego over time, so too do we find a floating colony of ants that can move here and there, now with one ant steering ahead, now with another, obeys the will of the singular queen. In the same way drones are non-gendered or neuter, the male gender ants are less common, and the female queen individual and unique to each hive. We see the tertiary roles of leader, follower, and follower of the follower, established as a natural law through genetic evolution. Likewise, in secular esoterica do we maintain the value of the traditional role of alpha member in the modernized concept of a lodge grand master or group leader. However, what is it that causes the alpha member to be permitted by the other group members to lead? It is because the alpha member knows and understands not only their own role, but also those of their lessers, equals, as well. The Grand Master, thus, understands the rules of the ranks under them as naturally when they are in the lead, so to speak, as the other members permit the one to lead them. This is the same with ants, nerves, galaxies, even extra-dimensional superstrings. All of these play follow the leader among themselves. So you could say that while they are the active alpha member, the Grand Master should be considered among their group the Most High. Likewise, the second to follow after the alpha member or group leader is the Omega, or final or lowest position. The runner-up for the role of group leader is usually vilified by their acting alpha and ostracized before the whole group. However, the relationship between the alpha and omega does not end there. Far from it. It only just then has begun. The group villain is necessary for the group leader to establish their direction of leadership away from or in opposition against. Therefore, so long as there is an alpha, there will remain the need for the omega. One is opposite the other. Usually, the alpha and omega begin best friends, or are even siblings, an offspring of the elder Alpha. For one of them to prosper, however, will make the other to suffer, because between these twin or binary roles is only a closed system, and therefore has a fixed sum of inherent energy that cannot be added to nor subtracted from. Like blood pumping from one chamber of the heart to another, there is only one quantity substance that passes between the two, the alpha and omega. In short, they are actually equal all along, only sharing power between them in favor of one or the other to a greater or lesser degree. They are dependent on one another necessarily due to this fact. The third and final role that establishes rulership, both investing the Alpha with their authority and demanding acknowledgement as guidance by their leader, are the remaining largely silent masses. These consent to be governed by agreeing to follow the leader, 
However, they bow even lower before their chosen superior, or superiors, than the Omega, and by depriving themselves of their own authority, the silent majority follows the Omega, that is, follows their leader's first and most loyal follower, the group Nemesis. By debasing themselves, they disenfranchise themselves more than does the Alpha, the Omega, who could both otherwise exist in archetypal suspension separate from this third group. In the name of imitating the act of domination performed by their leader over the group enemy, the majority of any group repress their own urges as mere temptation and thus defeat themselves. Their groveling in the way of the leader astounds even the deposed nemesis. No matter how degraded, the group enemy will cling to the primacy of their equality to their oppressor. Equally so, the group leader can never completely deny the law of reciprocity of karma between themselves and their polar opposite. The leader is considered better the more followers they attract, which depends for quantity and quality on the Alpha's relationship to their prior equal, the Omega, now their enemy by polar opposition. If the leader interacts dynamically on a continual basis with their adversary, then their relationship will be more often imitated, and those attracted on invisible currents into their mutual wake will add and multiply in numbers. However, if two equals part ways and do not ever cross paths again, and their memories of one another are not tended to and maintained, and if their hearts grow disimpassioned towards one another, then no one will consider them opposites, nor follow one in opposition to the other, nor glorify one and vilify the other. Such should be considered the ideal situation by the wise Grand Master, that by assuming no animosity, having no adversaries, making no enemies, one can avoid depriving the silent masses of their authentic nature to self-govern, that is, to internalize archetypal duality, and thus to better themselves by self-selection. The ability to choose one's self to be their own leader, however, in itself, precedes immediately the temptation to actively vilify one's actual equals and thus to accumulate many silent followers one's self. The wise leader avoids animosity and adversities and thus attracts no followers. The wise leader allows all to lead and each equally. The wise grand master understands this trinity of social roles, the alpha and omega, able to exist autonomously alongside the silent masses. While the Alpha and Omega are equally codependent, each of the silent masses is equally independent. The wise leader sees this, avoids what is wrong, and cherishes what is right. The second title is Indigo. In the same manner as the base four tetragrammaton, or, for that matter, the pentad of Pythagoras, the color indigo is part of a group of seven variables capable of being corresponded to various other attributes that are arranged in base seven groups. For example, indigo is part of the tertiary color scheme, following from the combination of secondary tinctures from primary hues. Thus, take the primary blue of blue, red, and yellow. From thence, mix down the blue with black, 
achieving a dark, navy blue. Then, remix this with primary yellow. The blue and yellow will combine as green, while the black and yellow will render orange or burnt umber. The combination of the green with the orange yields a bluer green and a brighter blue. The result is the tertiary color, indigo. The reason that, as a color, indigo is tertiary, as opposed to the fact that it is one of the seven hues of the rainbow, is due to its being the combination to a primary color, blue, of first a hue, black, and then another primary color, yellow. Technically, black is the absence of hue and a combination of all colors. It is also necessary to mix these three elements in just the right ratios, mixing less yellow than black and less black than blue. Again, in the three ratios between indigo's component colors, we find the same trinary ratios of those between the drones, the males, and the female of an ant colony, or the three social roles of alpha, omega, and mass member. The queen is yellow, the males black, and the drones are blue. The alpha is yellow, the omega, or omegas, black, and the masses, blue. The superego is yellow, the id is black, and the ego is blue, and all of these are indigo. Indigo is itself a tertiary color, however indigo is also part of the base seven hues of the rainbow, refracted white light through a prism. On the rainbow, we see that indigo is a tertiary color between a primary color, blue, and a secondary color, violet, the combination of primary red with primary blue. The entire cycle of Roy G. Biv, from red to violet, precedes primary, secondary, primary, secondary, primary, tertiary, secondary. Indigo is the only tertiary color to appear in the base 7 rainbow scale of hues. The indication made by its presence should be clear. Indigo is opposed on the scale of hues to orange and green both, skipping over relativity to yellow. Indigo is the juxtaposed hue to orange, second from beginning and end of seven, and indigo is also the juxtaposed color to green, following from the sequence alternating primary and secondary colors in the rainbow. The terms used to describe such juxtapositions of relationship is flashing. Indigo flashes, or juxtaposes, against orange and indigo also flashes or stands out against green. In the prior case, orange is brighter than indigo, but in the latter case, indigo is brighter than green. Indigo does not juxtapose and thus does not flash with yellow as they are of equal tone or quantity of brightness in reflecting light. All the primary colors flash against one another. Yellow is brighter than red, and red is lighter than blue. The secondary colors in the rainbow also flash, such that orange stands out from green, and green stands out from violet. However, secondary violet also flashes more against the primary colors, while indigo flashes more against secondaries, orange and green. The fact that tertiary indigo flashes against secondary colors while secondary violet flashes against primaries 
is indicative of the odd seven base number system as opposed to an even numbered system such as if green were tertiary or could otherwise be dropped from the center. It is true that all the hues of rainbow light occur naturally in our planet's atmosphere except for, or at best, least occasionally, green. However, because the light that air and the clouds reflect is actually only shades of the one color we do not see them reflecting, the air and clouds of H2O are actually green, and just so, all the terrestrial shades of chlorophyll in plants are only reflecting the one color of light they do not absorb and so are themselves truly roseate. Thus, what is revealed by the interpolation of tertiary indigo into the primary, secondary, primary, etc. sequence of the rainbow's colors is that indigo acts as, or stands in for, a secondary color, while violet acts as a primary. However, what is the purpose for this substitution as opposed to that of the most deductive interpolation or removal of green, the central secondary. What can we make of the meaning of this? The third title is Cube. The cube is also an odd man out in its respective number base hierarchy. It was applied by Pythagoreans as the platonic solid corresponding to the element Earth. When one compares the remaining platonic solids and their corresponding elements, however, every single other one has to be rearranged. The dodecahedron of the exoteric cosmos is actually the element occurring first in the base 5 system and represents water, the prime element. Following this, the Greek isosahedron of water is, properly, air, the second element. After this, the Greeks placed the octahedron for air, rightly, of fire. Finally was the tetrahedron of false fire actually an attribute of cosmos, the fifth element of spirit. But the cube remains the same. The reason for this shift in sequence for the dodecahedron, isosahedron, octahedron, and tetrahedron is due to the two different cosmological belief systems of the Greeks and the Hebrews. The Hebrews sequence for the cosmological creation of the four elements was based on concentric spheres, the so-called four worlds model of Kabbalah that were meant to mimic the composition of our planet, Malkuth, with earth final, water above earth, air above water, and fire primary to all, the sun. The Greek version placed fire last in the underworld, or middle earth, below and within earth as the tetrahedron before and beneath the cube. Thus, their cosmology preceded outward from the interior flame, while the Hebrew cosmology inward from the exterior flame. The accurate order of appearance of the four universally elemental forces following the Big Bang places the order as 1. Water, dodecahedron, 2. Air, isosahedron, 3. Fire, octahedron, four, earth, cube. Again, we see that in all these different orders of various attributes, cosmological elements and platonic solids, only the cube remains constant throughout. In the Greek, Hebrew, and modern cosmologies, the cube stands ubiquitously for the element of earth. Some, in apology for the Greek version of events, compare the cube's shape to the sturdiness of the ground beneath our feet. They say the cube, embedded, cannot be uprooted. It is to the base four geometry of the cube we owe the four elemental forces of material reality, 
expressed as scarlet, gold, citrine, and black in Malkuth, and the four spatial dimensions, including the hyperspatial dimension of time, that govern these forces in material reality. The four worlds of Kabbalah, the Tetragrammaton, and the four standard positions of the line, square, cube, and tesseract, whose shadows are binary, base 4, base 8, and base 16, respectively, all factors of 4, and which are all reducible to the fifth position, the single dimensional point. Thus, all have their counterparts likewise in the base 5 spiritual element, double fire within and without, running and returning, ascending, descending, and all permeating simultaneously, represented by the twin conjoined tetrahedrons of the stella octahedron. So too the interpolation of the mother letter Shin to render the name of Christ from that of God. The fourth title is Strong Nuclear. The modern scientific term for the force related with the cube by the ancient Greeks and with the element Earth by the elder Hebrews is the strong nuclear force. This force is carried on the very stable particles of gluons, mesons, and quarks. The smallest or most fundamental of atomic elements is a nucleus surrounded by a single electron in the form of hydrogen. No atomic nucleus can exist unless infused by at least one electron. If the electron is removed from the hydrogen atom, the nucleus will decompose and the result will be the opposite of the cohesive earth element, the decohesive weak nuclear force of elemental fire. The weak nuclear force is associated with radioactive particle decay and occurs naturally and gradually over time for all atomic nuclei. We use this particle decay of atomic elements to date the formation and history of all forms of once living matter by tracing the decay rate of radiocarbon-14 it emits. The human species, at this point in its evolution, has come to rely heavily on the weak nuclear elemental force of fire, but we know next to nothing about the force of strong nuclear cohesion, the element called earth in the sense of all solid matter. We comprehend that all matter gradually breaks down into energy, but we cannot account for how the matter that does exist came to exist in the first place. And before astronomical odds, the ability of a human mind to account for its own existence as a complex biological being fails. And the ability to explain our own mental existence, let alone shared psychic experiences, is not even yet dreamt of by our logical left brains. Instead, we usually choose to substitute an all-powerful designer with limitless foresight to perfect itself through ourselves in this incarnation. However, the explanation is quite simple and does not require divine design. In places, the universe acts like a closed system, attracting matter inward. In other places, at the same time, the universe acts like an open system recycling the attracted matter into energy by entropy. Instead of accepting the fact that matter is, even still, being compacted out of energy, we marvel at the appearance of something from nothing that we perceive occurring through our minimum light speed barrier veil of C. To us, antimatter is merely quantum particle decay and we have not learned the meaning of all matter is energy to be that some energy is slowed down to below C and that energy we call matter. So long as there remains matter, our universe will continue to exist. 
for when there is no matter to convert into energy, the universe will have dissolved into a nulliverse. At one point, the closed space and open time systems were in exact equilibrium. This was called the point of critical mass. Since that time, there has been more energy than matter overall, more entropy than attraction, and the oldest particles have formed black holes surrounded by galaxies of billions of stars and are gradually destroying them all. It was when the point of critical mass was finally passed ubiquitously throughout the whole universe that the various universal number systems slipped out of place relative to each other. This event was called in Hebrew cosmology the shattering of the clay pots or shells called the cliffoth. It is claimed that before this point of our universe's evolution was past, all was perfect periodicity, all universal cycles regular, and all manifestations perfectly symmetrical. This period is called by the Kabbalists paradise, heaven on earth, and Eden, followed by the fall of man. The fall of the rebel angels from the pure perfection of non-existence into corruptible matter is likewise associated with the original differentiation of the four forces from pure probability, only one Planck time following the Big Bang. This is considered as the first moment of creation of matter, of Earth, from which we mankind were made, that is, existence below sea. However, if we look beyond sea as only a minimum speed limit for light, then we will find that before the fall of man at cosmological critical mass and before the fall of angels one Planck time after the Big Bang and before even the genesis of something from nothing there we will find not an insurpassable barrier beyond which is God's business, not man's, guarded by a flaming sword, but only the true light of clear consciousness, pure, unmoved, and unwavering observation, what has long been called heaven of pure spirit and the cosmos of the fifth element. It is not blinding white light, but a clear, invisible glow, a brightness behind, before, and within a darkness. However, it would be out of place for me to speak of this realm any further here, because this exposition deals solely with the slow energy of matter particles attracted into atoms by electron charge and gravity. Cosmologically, it is reckoned that, prior to the genesis of matter from pure energy, only chaos, tohu, and desolation, bohu, existed. And, moreover, it is reckoned from these two God formed our existence. The fifth title is Mercury. While in discussing the four elemental forces and five platonic solids, we had diverged slightly down the scale from the base seven color scheme of the visible light spectrum. Now, in discussing Mercury, we must return to the base seven system. Before we begin, it should also be noted that this Mercury is the planetary Mercury and not the alchemical Mercury, and that, by comparison between the planets and alchemical metals, we would indeed find Quicksilver, the equivalent to planetary Mercury, as well as the Pradalyahara, or crown chakra, emanating from the top of the head. So what we are left with in our current context is still to relate the first planet, Mercury, 
to the other attributes under discussion, e.g., the color spectrum, the elements, and the regular solids. As I have already explained, the cube can be related to the elemental force of Earth, the so-called strong nuclear force, and the cube, being unique among five, is therefore alike indigo, the only tertiary color in the spectrum, in that both represent a shifting, or slipping, between the four Hebrew elements and five Greek solids that I will next further discuss relative to the seven colors and seven planets. First, however, Mercury is the name of the Roman anthropomorphic messenger deity. As the Greek Hermes, he was said to have taught alchemy and astrology and been called Trismegistos, thrice greatest. As such, he has been likened also to the Egyptian moon scribe Thoth. What this should show us is how, over time, as an attribute is passed from one culture to another, its meaning changes or shifts, as in this case from Thoth, originally a lunar deity, to the astrological planet Mercury. This should underscore the fact that all pantheist deities are merely an exoteric sleight of hand to misdirect an aspirant's attention away from studying these attributes, not autonomously, but relative to their basic number group. For example, we have already seen what defines indigo as unique in the base 7 color spectrum. Now let us compare the astrological Mercury and some prior cosmological base 7 system. Now Thoth was revered as a god in Egypt since the times before the flood of Mesopotamia in around 6000 BCE. This means he could be said by the Greek reckoning to have been Atlantean and that by the Hebrew reckoning thus related to the pre-Diluvian patriarch Enoch. However, neither of these describe a cosmological principle in a base 7 system, and so we should set these important parallels aside for now. However, according to the 15th century CE magician William Barrett, astrological planet Mercury does relate to an attribute in a base 7 system which, as it turns out, does represent a component in a cosmology, and, it also turns out, the knowledge of this cosmology may be older itself than the Mesopotamian flood of around 6000 BCE. In truth, this other base 7 system, correspondent to the seven astrological planets, may indeed be Atlantean. Consider for a moment the seven Gnostic realities or powers of the authorities or archons. While there was a contemporary zodiac of twelve celestial signs, this alternate base seven system persisted alongside the base twelve system of Gnostic zodiacal aeons, or the fallen archons themselves, including Cain and Abel, along with other unique names. Thus, twelve-month years and seven-day weeks have come down to us as our formal calendar and shared method of measuring lifetimes. Each Gnostic power belonged between both of two archons, the equivalent of this system by the time of Barrett consisted of seven angelic names and their sigils or signatures. The angelic names are a little different from the seven planets used more as a placeholder. However, the seven sigils or seals of the angels given are the more significant point of comparison between these other two 
the seven planets of astrology and seven powers of the archons, according to Gnosticism. In the late 19th century, Egyptologist E. A. Wallace Budge added to these angelic sigils an additional surrounding glyph he called the sigil's position in the zodiac. While also alluding to the layman for arrangement of the base 7 system relative to the base 12, the planets and zodiac, the glyphs themselves, if pieced together in the round, fit into one another to form a distinctly unique shape within which the angelic sigils are then inscribed. The shape formed by the glyphs is that of the folding up around an equiangular spiral of Pythagorean triangles. The Pythagorean theorem triangle has legs of lengths 3 and 4 at right angles, with hypotenuse between them length 5. This triangle is unique since it uses whole numbers to express ratios that occur, for the most part, as fractions and decimal place integers. However, by fixing the expansion rate of the base unit per unfolding triangle in the Pythagorean spiral, we find we can create a scale from the 3-4-5 triangle up through a 4-5-6 using a different sized base unit and 5-6-7 ad infinitum. It seems the ancients referenced by Budge had also discovered this mnemonic expansion rate and the unique shape that it formed. They had built the shape of seven sizes of square into the places in the zodiac glyphs around the angelic sigils. Each place in the zodiac glyph fits together like puzzle pieces to form the shape of the expanding squares around a spiral of Pythagorean triangles. Now, insofar as we can take the seven puzzle glyphs forming the squares around a triangle spiral by the words of their name, that is, as the place in the zodiac of each angelic sigil, then we can return to the way the seven powers were related to the twelve archons by the Gnostics, or Greek Hebrews. The sigil of Mercury's equivalent angel occurs in the upper right place in the zodiac glyph piece of the square spiral layman. However, according to Barrett, the signs of the zodiac ruled over by the planet Mercury are on opposite parts of the circular base 12 zodiac and this attribution by Barrett of signs to planets appears to be an entirely autonomous model apart from the angelic sigils and their place in the zodiac given later by Budge. However, it seems likely the model of seven sigils within the unique square spiral shape being based on Pythagorean mathematics indeed predates Barrett's attributes of two signs per planet. The sixth and seventh titles are Gemini and Virgo. Now, the squares forming the sides of the spiral of Pythagorean triangles have different sized base units from one another, as I'd mentioned, but now we should consider the ratio from one to the next of their rate of expansion. For example, in the case of the square with six units, it adjoins a square of five and of seven as legs on two separate triangles, as well as is opposite a square of seven and a square of eight for these same two triangles hypotenuses. However, so far as the layman of glyphs extends, there is no square of one or 2, and the square of 10 does not appear, only the 7 including 3 through 9, 1 being 3, and 7 being the square of 9. From the Greek system of sigils, magic number squares, gematria and geometry 
called the Camia of the Seven Olympic Dignitaries, described by Henry Cornelius Agrippa in the 16th century CE. We find allusion drawn between Mercury and the eight squared, eight by eight square of 64 base units. This is how, before I could say the sigil of the angel equivalent to Mercury, occupied the position of the zodiac in the upper right corner of the glyph puzzle shape of the square spiral, because that is where the eight squares overlap when the shape is folded into three dimensions. That is why the angelic sigil of the upper right glyph piece is equivalent to Mercury, which is equivalent itself to the eight square of the upper right corner of the unfolding Pythagorean spiral of squares when it remains a graph on a flat plane. Because the squares are comprised of an increasing ratio of size difference for their base units, we can measure this rate of ratio increase easily enough by using the Pythagorean theorem, applying the triangles already present. Because the square leg of one triangle is also the leg of another triangle on the square's adjacent side, and because the equivalent sized squares forming the legs of those two triangles also connect to the same size square on the opposite hypotenuse, of yet a third Pythagorean triangle when the model is folded up into three dimensions, then we can easily demonstrate that the expansion rate of base unit size ratios is the golden mean of one to two or two thirds. We can ascertain this by the fact we are using Pythagorean triangles to measure base unit expansion rate and these inherently contain the golden ratio, or phi. Thus, the spiral of Pythagorean triangles measures phi in two dimensions, and thus, the squares of these same triangles arranged in their phi ratio of expansion rate are, themselves, folded and meet in a pi ratio when the shape is bent and turned until it maps into three dimensions. The unique shape of the positions of the zodiac glyph pieces combined as a layman indicates what appears to be a very intricate understanding of very esoteric geometry based on number theory. So the base seven system of Kamiya squares which are synonymous to the base seven places in the zodiac glyphs, which are synonymous to the base seven angelic sigils, which are synonymous to the base seven planets of astrology, is truly an entire complete system of its own, autonomous even of the seven alchemical metals and the seven bodily chakras. It appears that, because of the early dates at which these component materials were all mentioned, because of the Greek and Hebrew Gnostic Apocrypha that substantiates the perpetuation of such base seven systems even earlier on, and because of the indecipherably archaic nature of this particular system, the knowledge of this precise pattern, this unique shape, representing Pythagorean geometry may indeed be ancient in the extreme. The knowledge of such geometry may have even existed more than 8,000 or even 10,000 years ago, long before the destruction by the flood, in the very place and time the Greeks call Atlantis and the Hebrews call Enoch. There is a sufficient amount of evidence to warrant such a conjecture as to say the Pythagorean spiral of squares shape was known of before the flood, simply in the fact alone that the seven planets were attributed one or two each of the signs of the zodiac. In fact, excluding the sun and moon of astrology, the remaining five planets is each ruler over two zodiac signs. 
the sun and moon alone rule over one each. I hope that it is plain to see by now that these five are thus also equivalent to the platonic solids, the four elemental forces, and the seven color spectrum accordingly. The eighth title is Nefesh. In the same manner as the soul is the aura, the spirit hovers over and descends down into the soul and permeates it with calmness and sound reasoning. The spirit is the measurement phi over pi, the soul, the surface of the torus of the aura, without, and the chakras within, and the body, merely a shell, in which we can hear the sound of ocean waves breathing. Therefore, understand that the Pythagorean order of death recognizes a base five number system for its degrees. However, it should also be seen how the base seven rainbow and base four elements also play in. Our base five system is only one branching pattern stemming from the fractal spiral growth pattern of primes and other sacred numbers that extends its creeping vines throughout all, forming superstrings of hyperdimension, filaments of galaxies, and nerves of biological cells. Through the phi over pi ratio of space to time, through the phi over pi ratio of matter, to energy, and through the phi over pi ratio of our genetic DNA. Neshima is, therefore, a ubiquitous measure, phi over pi, found everywhere, albeit only imperfectly now, post-critical mass, throughout the universe. For there are many souls, each individual each unique, all imperfect, all aperiodic. Yet there is one spirit, all-inclusive and ubiquitous, perfectly periodic. It is said that this one spirit is God, creator of our material universe. But I will tell you, you can understand the wisdom of this phi over pi geometry without being expected to prove it to disbelievers. You need not usurp the standard of perfection set by God. I will tell you, no phi over pi, but know also that none among us is truly the most high. We are all equal, infinite in potential. Know that we need not worry about whom to follow nor how best to lead. Know that the phi over pi spiral is the pattern underlying all evolution versus entropy of and in our universe. From before the Big Bang, through the Planck time following it, beyond critical mass to the nulliverse. In the Pythagorean order of death, at the degree of Lodge Grand Master, one learns to see the Neshima, the one spirit, the pure, invisible, perfect geometry of phi over pi everywhere in the universe, occurring simultaneously on all levels of manifestation by perceiving the indigo cube of Earth, the cameo of Mercury, and angelic sigil, its place in the zodiac of seven, and its rulership over Gemini and Virgo. All these things are hence one in the Neshima, manifesting upon karma in your aura. They shall become you, and you must incorporate them, as they are now affecting you on a purely mental level already. Consider the Neshima, the phi over pi spiral measurement upon the surface of the invisible torus of energy of your aura. It is above all karma, like ink upon paper, like oil upon water, 
like a bird upon air, and it measures all karma perfectly, though what it measures is below it, like blood in a vein, like trees exhaling oxygen, like a fish in the water, and it is imperfect, irregular, intermittent, and sorrowful. Neshima, the spirit, is exalted, high, and divine, clear, invisible light. It is the shimmering image of the moon reflected upon waves, and these waves are Nuit, and this moon, Thoth, and this clear, invisible light, the true essence of the emanation of Kether, that is, the mind devoid of all thought, clear as crystal, the cleansed aura, Neshima, the spirit, the pattern, Phi over Pi, the yin-yang of karmic chi in the Tao, the measure of each of our auras, our unique field of potential energy, our personal bubble. Yet, though the Neshima is perfect, the soul can never be perfect so long as it is bound to the living flesh. Because the living flesh is entirely the glove, the puppet of the soul. Only when the soul has been stripped free from the body can it, as pure mentation, the mind willing itself into existence, escape painlessly through any wormhole or black hole to explore the cosmology of our reality in order to become more perfect before, more transparent to, the clear light of Neshima and to dissolve itself into phi over pi. The lowest portion of the soul is that with which we perceive our own existence, and this was called by the Egyptians the Ka, or energy double, meaning literally shadow. In the Indus Valley, the Vedic priests instructed that this energy shadow, or personal bubble, was rightly called the aura, comprised of chi energy that surrounds a person in the form of binary, good or bad, choices called karma, and that interacts with the person in their seven chakras, nerve centers called ganglii or plexuses, occurring along the spine. Below the divine, perfect measurement, of phi over pi, the eternal geometry of the Neshima, the one spirit of all material existence, is the imperfect, aperiodic soul, the aura and chakras of the individual. In the highest of the four worlds of Kabbalah, there is the one spirit. In the next lower are the many souls. Below that, the many bodies. The lowest world is the single body, and within it, a single soul that, by ascension, connects in turn directly to the single spirit. Thus, the body, the biological form containing the nerves, the nerves, cells of DNA, the DNA of molecules, the molecules, atoms, atoms quanta, we initiates call the nefesh. The substance of our bodies, that is, containing all lesser layers or levels of matter, and these extrapolable to all material reality, is thus a glove worn by the mental existence that is self-perceiving. Like a man floating out very deep in the ocean, the portion above the surface of quantum foam is the self-aware existence of the psyche, while that below the surface of the space-time continuum is sunk into, entrenched, drowning in a quagmire of the merely material and purely physical existence, and like a man floating in deep water, the portion below depends on that above to survive. There are inert masses in matter, but those of us possessed of sentience 
are capable of self-motivating function. We are thus beings from this higher level, merely floating in the depths of this incarnate lifetime. Thus, even the lowest part of the soul, the aura and chakras perceiving themselves as the mind, is in direct contact above to the Neshima, Phi over Pi, the omniversal Unis spirit, and below to the Nefesh, the exclusively existent yet inanimate and unliving base matter of our physical composition. The Neshima descends down into the Nefesh in the form of the aura and the seven chakras, just as does the mind inhabit and fill up the body. Yet all within and without the barrier of our biological influence and all existence beneath see the surface of the quantum continuum are the same substance, and this stuff, the vibrational dimension of solid energy, is the nefesh. As I have said, so long as the mind is bound to the body, the mind is not at utter liberty to come unstuck from the physical plane. Though we can imagine beyond C, well enough to make accurate geometric calculations, and by doing so demonstrate our mental capability to take such a quantum leap necessary to cross the threshold of a black hole or travel through a wormhole, although we can accomplish these feats mentally while alive, we will only be experiencing the events we observe mentally, at will, and as if in a dream, and can just as easily snap back to our ordinary physical existence as living biological organisms. Thus, it is only after the death of our flesh vessel that the mind can truly become detached from the physical body and thus fully experience the potential events occurring in both our own physical as well as the metaphysical realms which we can now only imagine. While we are alive, we can predict exactly what traveling through a wormhole from one point in space to another would be like. Only after our death as physical beings will we be able to truly experience it. So it is also with the realms above and beyond sea, the space-time surface of our quantum continuum. And remember that, like a man at sea, we are from land, and by walking up the shore and onto it, we arise from out of this universe to return to worlds entirely beyond it. The realms we imagine now in our minds are the vistas of the spiritual realms beyond material reality. This concludes my knowledge lecture on the titles of Three Degree Essene Zealot.